Hello, this is Henry Quillian here at Taylor English Duma with all my colleagues. This is Litigation Fundamentals with Henry Quillian. Today we also have a guest appearance by David Weiss, uh, one of our attorneys here who has looked into the subject matters of today. You may see that even though it's in the middle of the summer, I'm wearing my mortuary suit. And that's because today's topic is dealing with the dead. What happens if somebody dies in the midst of litigation? who is a party to the litigation. Uh, it's a rather gloomy subject, but we're going to tackle it so that it doesn't become gloomy for you, the lawyer, as opposed to only your clients and the other parties in the litigation. Uh, the topic is uh, driven by case law principally, although there are civil procedure rules relating to somebody dying in the midst of a litigation. If you go back to the beginning of time, before there were such things as the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure and the Georgia Civil Practice Act, you would learn that when a lawyer is representing a person and that person dies, the agency between the lawyer and the person uh, disappears. And that fundamental principle is included in the restatement of agency, for instance, because it is a restatement of the common law that's recognized in most states. Uh, for those of you out there that are watching that are not attorneys, we are not providing legal advice to you, and uh, you need to get an attorney to deal with your situation, and, uh, and or just take this as general information associated with litigation. And if you are an attorney, you need to do your own research and be responsible for your own conclusions based on wherever it is you're practicing law and uh, whatever you're trying to do on behalf of your clients. So, uh, if you have no agency between the client, the dead client, and the lawyer, then that puts, obviously puts an ongoing litigation into a nebulous state. Uh, but that is a fundamental principle, and that because the agency is lost, the lawyer cannot act on behalf of the client anymore until other things have occurred within the litigation. Well, as you know, uh, the Georgia Civil Practice Act is, uh, in some respects, modeled after the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. And in both sets of rules, Rule 25, in Georgia it would be 9-11-25, and in the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure it would be Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 25, set forth things that can happen in a lawsuit relating to when somebody dies and provide for remedies, but there's a heavy case law overlay on these rules. The rules are short. We found that the case law is long <laughs> relating to how things might play out associated with somebody's death. So we would go briefly through the 9-11-25, and then I'm going to jump over to Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 25 because they are very similar <coughs> but somewhat different. Uh, basically, the layout is if somebody dies in a litigation and the claims are not extinguished, then there has to be a mechanism for the case to move forward. There are concerns of the people who are associated with the claims of the person who passed away. There are concerns of the other parties in the litigation. There are concerns of the court knowing who the people are that are litigating before the court. And then there is, are concerns about who can actually speak for and act for uh, the decedent's claims. So principally we're starting here with the, pre with the premise that whatever claim it was that the decedent had does not simply disappear upon the death. Uh, David will address that situation and in fact uh, other sections of the civil procedure rules address what happens when, when the claim just vanishes because of the death of the person. So. If death does occur, and let's assume for the moment it's the plaintiff who dies, and it's a claim that can continue on, then uh, what are the possible solutions for this situation? 
Well, as I mentioned, the lawyer representing the plaintiff no longer represents anybody in the lawsuit, which is a hard thing for lawyers who have an engagement agreement, I suppose, with a former alive client to deal with. And in your own mind, you probably think, well, I'm the representative of the claims in the case as the lawyer. Well, that's not the case. You're actually representing a person in the case. And if that person dies, you're not representing anybody in the case. So keep that in mind because if you rock along and do your whole case and then decide to stick, uh, try to substitute somebody, you may find that a lot of what you did basically came to nothing and we'll go into those circumstances. So, and then the people that are being sued by the plaintiff, they may think, well, gee, this, this plaintiff has gone away. Uh, uh, I guess we dodged a bullet here. Uh, but maybe those claims don't disappear. But can the parties get rid of the case that has been brought by this plaintiff and make it go away? So Rule 25 provides for uh, a circumstance where a dead party can be substituted for by uh, somebody else uh, in order to continue the litigation. But there are limits on how that's done and who can do it. Now, uh, if you look at, if it says, if a party dies and the claim is not thereby dis extinguished, the court may order substitution of the proper parties. The motion for substitution may be made by any party or by the successors or representative of the deceased party and together with notice of the hearing shall be served on the parties <coughs> as provided in code section 911.5 and upon persons not parties in the manner provided for in code section 911.4 for services, service of a summons. <coughs> so, uh, I think what happens is lawyers think that they're still, uh, that the deceased person is still a party and then they act on behalf of that party. But that's not actually the case. The only person that can move on behalf of, to substitute, is either a legally appointed representative of the estate of the person who died under letters of administration or letters testamentary, whatever they might call it in the individual state, or another party who still is a party to the litigation because the dead person is no longer a party. Uh, and so, for instance, a defendant could move uh, to substitute a representative as the party plaintiff if they wanted to after the party plaintiff has died. They would have to designate the person. Uh, a administrator of the estate could move the court and if, it, if they're using the same lawyer as the lawyer that had been representing the deceased party, they sure as heck better be able to prove they're actually representing the estate by perhaps attaching an engagement letter or an affidavit or something saying that they've been engaged by the estate to do this on behalf of the estate. Because if, if the lawyer just signs on as the attorney for the dead person, that's not going to go anywhere or raise a question of fact whether there's any authority whatsoever for this motion to be made. The other thing that can happen is a notice of death can be filed on by the, typically by the defendants if it's a deceased plaintiff. And that, if done properly, starts this time period that's mentioned in 9-11-25 running. And you'll see that 9-11-25 and Georgia Civil Practice Act is different in this respect uh, from Rule 25 under the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. So if you're involved in a case and you question whether the rules are the same as between the Georgia Civil Practice Act and the Federal Civil Rules, what do you do? Read the rules. There we go. Okay. Because if you just presume one is like the other, you're going to be in trouble. Because under this one, if and we'll go into what it is, but if a statement of death uh, which is, uh, is filed by and properly served, et cetera, by a party to a litigation, 
uh, saying that a party has died, it says, unless the motion for substitution is, not, is, is made not later than 180 days after the death is suggested, that's what they call it in Georgia, suggestion of death, on the record by service of a statement of fact of death, the action shall be dismissed as to the cease party. And so if you are a defendant in a case where you've got a plaintiff and the plaintiff dies, you might want to take the necessary steps, which we'll go into, to file and serve a statement of death and then pray that nobody ever gets around to uh, doing a motion for substitution for the plaintiff and then you can move to dismiss uh, the case against your client. Uh, so we're not going to go deeply into it, but there's also a provision under 911-25A2 that says if, the, if, if in the event of a death of one of the plaintiffs, if the right sought to be enforced survives only to the surviving plaintiffs or only against the surviving defendants, the action does not abate. The death shall be suggested on the record and the action shall proceed in favor of against or against the surviving party. So if you have a situation where the claims vaporize as to the, plaintiff, the party that has died or potential claims, I don't know how they would vaporize as to the defendant, but let's assume it's an action for an injunction against the defendant to not do something or to do something, and the person dies, they can't very well do it. So if the, if the, then the, in that instance, you just put a record of the death on the record, and the case continues on without that party. Now, can somebody tell me if... Take a second and read Federal Rules of Procedure 25 and tell me what a basic difference is between 9-11-25 and Federal Rules of Procedure 25. Excuse me? 90 days. All right, 90 days instead of 180 days. Uh, so th does that mean that if you're in federal court, you have to be a little bit more on your toes than you are in state court if somebody files a notice of death on the record and properly serves it? The answer is yes, if you are representing another party to the litigation. And what if you're representing, let's just make it simple, let's say you're, on a, you're, a plaintiff, you're representing a plaintiff on a contingency fee case, you've got the case 99% prepared, you've got all the evidence, uh, of record and, dep and depositions and such, and one of the defendant files a notice of death on the record and properly serves it. Uh, what would you want to do if you had never contacted the representative of the estate or never found out whether a representative of the estate uh, has been appointed? Oh, come on now. If you had a contingency fee case and it's 99% prepared, you're going to want to make sure somebody comes in and, that, and hires you <laughs> to continue the case so that you can get your contingency fee, right? <laughs> and so uh, you, better you better make sure that the decedent's family has taken the necessary steps to get an appointment of a representative for the estate and then move to substitute before the expiration of 90 days if you're in federal court. Uh, so that you can continue the case forward on behalf of the claims of the former decedent, former client that you had. Because if you don't get hired by the uh, estate, what can you do in this litigation for your dead client? Can't do anything. So, so uh, basically, you have a vested interest in wanting this case to go forward and to get your damages and to get your attorney's fees, but if you don't do anything, then the defendants can just move to dismiss and then everything's going to go up in smoke. Uh, so you don't want that to happen to you. Besides that, somebody would probably complain about you allowing that to happen. Uh, you, I don't think you can very well go to the spouse of the decedent who you're representing and say, uh, sorry, I didn't tell you anything about this, but you know, I just let the case die uh, because I, I didn't want, I couldn't represent your husband anymore, so I just decided to 
you know, close the file. I don't think they would be very happy about that. Okay. So, yes, sir. What if the defendant, under your scenario, the defendant dies? I'm representing the plaintiff, and I got all this investment into my contingency case. I find out a defendant has died, and no one on the defendant side is, is making a motion to substitute in for the defendant. As I read this, I'm at, I'm at risk, and I need to go ahead and file a motion for substitution um, of somebody for that defendant, or my claim against the deceiving defendant will be dismissed, correct? Okay, so the question is, this is just for the videos, uh, <laughs> the question is, if you're representing a defendant, and you're, and, excuse me, you're representing a plaintiff, and the defendant you're suing on behalf of your alive plaintiff dies, uh, what do you need to do to make sure that you keep your case alive as to that defendant? Uh, if you're representing the plaintiff, then you are representing a what in the litigation? A party, right? If you're representing a party to the litigation, then you are empowered under this rule 25 to make a motion for substitution uh, to have somebody appointed uh, to represent the decedent's interests in the case so that the case can validly go forward against that decedent. We will cover some circumstances where plaintiffs didn't do that and we'll see what happens. Uh, at least in federal court, if a plaintiff doesn't substitute for a deceased defendant. So, uh, so what you would do in that instance, and we will go over it, is either file a motion to substitute and, uh, as you'll, I'm going to switch to A, uh, 25A3 under the Federal Rules of Procedure. You have to fight, if you're the defend, if you're the plaintiff's lawyer, you would move to substitute for the deceased defendant, and you have to serve that motion for substitution in accordance with Rule 5 against all the other parties. And so what does that mean with respect to the decedent's lawyer? Is that lawyer a proper recipient of your motion uh, to substitute? Yeah, the well, the is no longer a law, no longer a party. So that means you have to serve all the other parties and you have to serve in accordance with rule four, your motion to substitute against the representative of the estate of the defendant and or all the heirs at law of the defendant, which can be extremely burdensome if you have no idea uh, who these people are, which, what does that tell you about discovery you might seek along the way with respect to a party? You might have to ask, it's certainly going to be helpful if the person suddenly gets the bucket uh, for you to know who their spouse is, who their children are, because the natural uh, heirs if they die into state, because you might have to serve all those people down the road with a motion for substitution. Now David will discuss, well, do you also have to file a notice of death on the record and serve it in the same manner? There is case, there, the rule doesn't say that, but there's case law that does say that. So do you have to file a notice of death and then immediately file, or sometime Shortly thereafter, file a motion for substitution for that party you want to continue to litigate against. Uh, we're going to recommend yes, because basically the notice of death is easy. It's the service of the whole thing that's hard. You might as well file both of them and serve them all together. So uh, there are a couple of things to remember. Somebody has to be substituted in on behalf of the dead person. Only a party can do this or an actual appointed legal representative of the estate of the person who died, not the lawyer who formally represented the dead person, unless that lawyer has been specially retained by the estate of the person. Uh, and 
whenever you do anything in connection with this rule, Rule 25, either under Civil Practice Act or under the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, you have to serve those documents as to all parties like you would a normal motion or something in a lawsuit, or, well, and all non-parties, which would include the estate and potentially the heirs of the person using Rule 4, which means using a process server uh, to actually serve, or presumably you could also use the waiver of service requirements, but that's going to slow things down because you don't want to happen to you what's happened to other people in litigation we're going to talk about where the lawsuit gets all messed up and you, a lot of the claims might disappear or get dismissed because of failure to do these things properly. So, fundamental thing to remember, dead person's lawyer is not a lawyer for a party because the person's no longer a party because they're dead. If you can remember that, that's helpful. So, and no matter how much they protesteth uh, that they are the lawyer for the uh, dead person, uh, you need to say, well, I need to see your engagement agreement with the administrator of the estate. I need to see the letters of testamentary from the dead person estate. Something, you need to have proof that the, law, that the person has actually been appointed by the state where the person lives and formerly lived and also whether the lawyer has actually been retained because lawyers, I presume, in some ignorance may say, yeah, sure, of course I'm still representing the claims that the decedent had, but they're not representing a party anymore, so service under Rule 5 isn't going to work. Okay, with that, we're going to take a moment, momentary break. David's going to come up, and uh, he is going to go through the pitfalls associated with uh, Rule 25 and other dealings with the dead. Hey, everyone. Uh, David Weiss here. Um, if I haven't met you, it's a pleasure. And I'm happy to be up here today talking about death. And, you know, Henry's already gone over some of some of the some of the words that seem like maybe they'll tell a lawyer it seems simple you know this is a relatively short rule there's not a bunch of subparts to it but frankly there are a lot of words in this rule that courts have just imputed into it and they've had consequences to cases and they can have serious financial consequences to cases uh, most notably litigating a case while this issue hasn't been resolved can lead to voidness of actions that had taken place before then and obviously if that happens and you've had uh, successful positions in a case you're not going to be happy but going over some of uh, some of the specifics so two steps to substitution. It doesn't say anywhere in the rule, like Henry mentioned, that you need to file a suggestion of death or a notice of death. It doesn't say you have to do that. It's, it's something you can do. And what it says you, another thing it says you can do is file a motion to substitute. Well, courts have, uh, courts have in fact said that it is required, some of them, have said that it's required to file a notice of substitution, or a notice of death, sorry. And that's just nowhere in the rules. And you would have no way to know that by reading the rule, and it's why this is just such a tricky one that you have to research, especially jurisdiction-wise, to see if the court's gonna be strict on this, or if it's something that maybe the courts, there are some more liberal courts on this, on this point. So you have, you have a Ninth Circuit case, for example, saying that the notice of death is, a, is an affirmative step in order to trigger the 90-day period that starts the ability to file a motion to substitute. That's nowhere in the rule. Um, and then, and then you, have a, you have other courts calling it a requirement, a requisite. But regardless, 
the the safer thing to do when you when you have a death of a party is if you're interested in getting the action going, obviously, and you're a party that has the ability to do it, you file a notice of death. And that's the other that's another thing about what Henry was talking about, where if you have if can you file a motion to substitute? Well, it's unclear if you can just file a motion to substitute without any suggestion of death on the record at all. It's how you know, how could you file a motion if you don't have any proof of the death to submit to the court. So that's why having the notice of, notice of death or a suggestion of death on the record, uh, you're covering your base, the court can say, okay, well, that's not an issue here. We don't have a lack of evidence and it's just the safer play. Isn't that a concern that uh, if you're the plaintiff, let's say you're the representing the dead plaintiff, and uh, the executor or the estate comes in and says, I want to hire you to be the lawyer for the uh, estate as well. Uh, and you go and file a notice of death on the record. Uh, should you also have a motion to substitute prepared to go right away? Or should you just file a notice of death and then think about getting around to the motion for substitution? Well, I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, your own clock. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So the point is, once you file that notice of death, you're starting the clock to run. So you certainly don't want that time period to run out. Well, and that's 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 why it depends on you know who has the interest in getting the case going, and that can obviously vary depending on the circumstances. But a lot of the times, a lot of times, if you're if you're the plaintiff, you're gonna want the case to get over with, and are you going to want to get towards resolution of the case? And so. We actually have this case here. Uh, it's a bankruptcy Northern District of Indiana case called L-E-I-T-E-R, where the judge comes straight out and says, for one to obtain substitution, the rule requires that two documents be filed. A a statement noting the death of the party, and B, a motion for substitution made no later than 90 days after service of that statement. Uh, does anybody believe that the rule actually says that, that you have to file a notice of death in order to file a motion for substitution? No. So here's an example where out of the blue, a court has very, very distinctly made a requirement that doesn't exist in the rule. And so, except that it does say that the, that the motion should be filed within 180 days or 90 days, I think, of the suggestion of death. So you could impute it because if, if you file the motion without the suggestion of death, the court, I guess, could also say that it's been filed too early. That's a, that's a good point. Do you repeat well, that for the record? So, okay. sure. So, the what was your exact question? Well, what he said yeah. is that, that, that the rules impute potential requirement for a notice of suggestion of death. Yeah, so do the rules impute a potential requirement for a suggestion of death? We, we discussed that, and I thought the resolution we came to was that the rules don't specify whether you have to file a notice or a motion, and if you can file a motion without it, then it doesn't say you can't file the motion earlier. Is, is that right? Right, but if you don't, Judge said, "Well, you didn't file a notice of death. Then you're stuck." There's, there's just no point in not. Is there anywhere a? a, a um, do, do, does do either the statutes provide what is required for something to be a notice of death, or in Georgia, a suggestion of death? Yes. Got that. Okay. It's on your second bullet point of your outline. Is it? Oh, is it the? Okay, yeah. So, well, that's not in in Georgia, but courts have courts have gone over what is required of a notice of death because again, it's not even required that you have to file one according to the according to the text. But it does say the requisites for a valid statement or suggestion of death 
are found in rules or in case law, it must be a written statement on the record, one. Two, naming the person to be substituted. Three, providing information to all appropriate parties. And four, it must be properly served by an appropriate party or a representative of an appropriate party. So. So the big question is, what is an appropriate party? Uh, and what information or which parties do you have to provide? And that gets to the issue of, do you have to go find all potential heirs of the person that passed? Presumably, if, there, if there's no specific person identified as the uh, representative of the estate, or even if there is, what if that's being contested by parties to the estate, do you need to serve everybody that might otherwise inherit from this person? And that matters, skipping down a service. Uh, the courts have been very clear that the service requirements are not a requirement that they will look past. Uh, if, if you don't comply with the service requirement, uh, the action you are looking to have taken, whether it be filing a notice of death or a motion to substitute, uh, they've pretty consistently rejected, uh, rejected those attempts. Um, do you have for example, a Tenth Circuit case saying to satisfy the rule, motion for substitution or suggestion of death must be personally served on non-party representative of deceased rather than deceased attorney, for example. So that actually segues right back to the second one. Who can notice the death and how? Well, as Henry was mentioning, it's not, it's not the attorney of the deceased, and that has had consequences too. You... <laughs> so, courts have been presented with situations where there have been, in the record, there's been evidence of the death, for example, uh, whether it be in a brief by uh, an attorney or whether it be uh, something in an order by a judge even, and that has been insufficient, according to the appellate courts, to serve as an evidentiary basis for the death to support a motion to substitute. Um, for example, uh, Southern District of New York case, a court's order noting plaintiff's death and placing case on a calendar, which was mailed to counsel for our, all parties, including the decedent's counsel, was insufficient to trigger the 90-day limitations period. Uh, that, that same exact circumstance took place uh, when defense counsel uh, made on the record during a discovery conference uh, it was on the record, but it was insufficient to actually put the notice of death on the record. And that's, that same applies to, the, to plaintiff's counsel. One of the big things that comes up is the party dies, the lawyer for the deceased files a notice of death, perhaps in advi ill advisedly, on the record, saying, hey, my client has died. And then they, there is no motion for substitution within the time frame required by law. So the question then arises, and then the other parties move to dismiss, saying, hey, the time ran. They, they filed a, there's a notice of death on the record. The time ran. The case is over. We're out of here. And, uh, of course, that puts the lawyer who filed the notice of death on the defensive. And what they say is, well, I wasn't authorized to file the notice of death. It's a nullity. Uh, the uh, I wasn't representing anybody. The person's dead. I'm not representing a party. This is just a uh, a uh, piece of paper that has no validity whatsoever. It's null and void. And the courts do hold that that is the case. That a lawyer formerly representing a deceased party cannot file anything that's valid. Uh, and so, therefore, the notice of uh, death is invalid. Therefore, no trigger. Started at that time to run. What if, what if I have represented two defendants in a case, one of them dies, I still represent a party, is my note suggestion of death in the record valid then? It depends on who you file it on behalf of. Yeah. I think you can, only, you can file it on behalf of your alive party and, and you have to serve yeah. in accordance with the yeah. Okay. And, and that can get into other issues like uh, whether the subject matter is intact or 
uh, whether substitution is proper as to some claims but not others, which is also a thing. Uh, you can have a motion to substitute be granted as to certain claims but denied as to other claims based on uh, whether, based on the character of the relief sought for or against that party. For example, uh, uh, District of New Jersey case, um, a plaintiff uh, was deceased, had brought uh, claims under the ADEA and a state law claim. The compensatory damages claim survived the death, but, and so the substitution motion was granted as to compensatory damages, but the liquidated and punitive damages claims were, did not survive the death and were denied. So the motion to substitute was granted in part and denied in part. And so just another tricky niche. Uh, but judicial discretion is, is where, where you always come back to in, in everything in law, it seems like. And here, uh, you, you have a case out of, it's the lighter case that Henry mentioned, out of uh, bankruptcy court, Indiana. Um, the court said, some courts have allowed corrective measures in order to comply with the procedural requirements for substitution of a proper party. So even if a party's made a mistake, some courts will you know, not be punitive in that, you know, whether it has to do with claims evaporating or suffering a windfall, that some courts will allow uh, corrective procedures. They'll direct the parties to uh, file a notice within X days. Um, and you'll see that after a, uh, you'll see that after a motion to dismiss is denied. A party will file a motion to dismiss saying they didn't file uh, the motion to substitute soon enough. It'll be denied and the court will direct them to do it timely. Uh, other courts have pointed out the futility and waste of judicial resources in such a grant and have not done so. And they've taken a strict interpretation of the rule. Uh, and then, nevertheless, uh, this court recognizes it as discretion to allow substitution, and Rule 25A only requires, or requires that a court may only order substitution if the claim is not extinguished. So ultimately, it may depend specifically on the jurisdiction or even the court that day, uh, whether, yeah, whether, whether a motion to substitute is going to be granted if it's been untimely or if the judge sees it as untimely, uh, but it's not in the rule either way. I was going to raise uh, a Georgia case. Uh, if we go back to the Georgia civil rule, rule of civil procedures, you see how this case, it says, uh, Unless a motion for substitution is made no later than 180 days after the death uh, is suggested on the record by service of a statement of the fact of death, the action shall be dismissed as to the deceased party. Does anybody read that as mandatory? Shall. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yet, yet, a Georgia case, uh, Jernigan versus. Collier, it's a 1973, 131 Georgia Appeals, 162, uh, holds that, uh, I thought I'd underline the spot, maybe you got, uh, it basically <laughs> holds that, oh, here we go, dismissal is not mandatory, despite the use of the word shall in the amended rule, even under these <laughs> circumstances. Therefore, dismissal is not automatic. Any dismissal which is not automatic, but which may be obtained necessarily, requires to, to effect a dismissal, the entry of an order of dismissal. Now, the issue in that case was, does this, the passage of time, result in the dismissal of a case? The answer is no, it's not automatic. You do have to have an order granting the dismissal. But... The, law, the case law, specifically citing the Wright and Miller under the federal rule, says it's not automatic, even though it says shall. And so that shows you how unreliable the civil procedure rules are. Uh, there's also uh, the concept that David was mentioning, which is plaintiff's attorney 
on behalf of his own deceased client files a notice of death and then allegedly has a hard time explaining to the decedent's heirs what the lawsuit is about and it took such a it took a very long time to describe that and to get engaged by the by the estate and then they go in and they uh, they don't move to substitute time passes motion to dismiss is filed and then the court finds it was excusable neglect on behalf of the of the decedent's estate not to file a motion to substitute in the time frame and they let the the matter go forward on behalf of the deceased party yes sir is there a case law about whether the dismissal is without prejudice or with prejudice and if it's without prejudice can the estate Revive the action in a new action? Yes. It hasn't been substituted? Yes, and I believe it is inconsistent, but actually I was looking at that, right? First, if the order says with prejudice, then it's with prejudice, and, and it's immediate, and, and uh, it's, if the time, if the notice of death has been properly served, the time frame is run, the motion to dismiss <coughs> has been. Uh, granted with prejudice, which is permissible under the rules, uh, then it's deemed to be with prejudice. If it's silent, then, then I guess you argue that there was some, that, that it was without prejudice, because the rule doesn't actually say what happens to it, uh, whether it's with prejudice or without prejudice. Uh, and I wish I could put my fingers on Let's see, does dismiss, this is a question in the Jernigan case, does a dismissal for failure to make a substitution in a timely fashion under the present rule, and it's weird, it's the state court talking about Federal Rule 25A1, operate as a dismissal upon the merits which precludes another suit in the same cause of action? What little authority there is under the original Rule 25A1 was in conflict, mainly because of the confused status of the original rule. That was a rule that said you had two years and that was it. We believe that a dismissal under the present Rule 25A1 for failure to make a timely substitution should operate as a dismissal on the merits. That's the Jernigan case. But there are other cases. Uh, present Rule 25A1, unlike the original Rule 25A1, operates to give notice to all interested parties of the fact of the death of the party and there is time limit upon which substitution until such notice shall be given. And even this time limit is now subject for enlargement for good cause shown in the discretion of the court. That's the excusable neglect. Thus, we think it is fair to require that substitution be made in accordance with Rule 25A1 at pain of a judgment on the merits for failure to comply. So as far as I know, in Georgia, especially if the court has evaluated an excusable neglect assertion and then dismisses the case, then uh, it looks to me like the case is dead as to that dead part. Thus, we are dealing with the dead today. Uh, I think that's most of what we had to cover. So. Thank you to David. Unless you got some stuff to add or questions to be answered. All right. Well, thank you all for being here.